Right now, you're watching this video. Maybe you clicked on it out of curiosity, maybe the title intrigued you, or maybe you don't even know why you chose it. Something just pulled you in. But here's a question that might unsettle you. Did you really choose to be here? Every day, life presents decisions. What to eat, what to wear, which words to say, which thoughts to follow. They feel personal, deliberate yours. But what if those choices weren't truly yours to begin with? The philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer once wrote, A man can do what he wills, but he cannot will what he wills. He wasn't playing with words. He was pointing to a reality few dare to face. The thoughts that arise in your mind, the preferences that shape your decisions, the impulses that push you one way or another, where do they come from? For centuries, thinkers have debated this question. Spinoza, Hume, Nietzsche, and countless others explored whether human beings are in control of their actions or simply following a script written by forces beyond them. But this isn't just an abstract idea trapped in old books. Modern psychology and neuroscience are now revealing something unsettling. Before you even become aware of a decision, your brain has already made it. In this video, we're going to explore one of the deepest and most controversial ideas in philosophy and psychology, the illusion of free will. Are you the architect of your fate? Or is your mind simply responding to invisible patterns you cannot control? And if free will is an illusion, what does that mean for how we live, how we judge others, and how we see ourselves? Prepare to step into the unknown. From the moment humans became aware of themselves, one question has haunted our existence. Are we truly free? We like to think of ourselves as independent agents, making choices based on reason, emotion, or intuition. But for centuries, philosophers have challenged this assumption. Some argue that free will is real, while others claim it's just an illusion we tell ourselves to feel in control. So let's get back to the famous quote from Arthur Schopenhauer. Man can do what he wills, but he cannot will what he wills. At first, this sounds strange, but think about it. You can decide to move your hand, speak, or even change careers. But did you choose what you desire in the first place? Did you decide to love coffee over tea? Did you pick your fears, your ambitions, or even the kind of thoughts that pop into your mind? Schopenhauer believed that while we can act on our desires, we do not control what we desire. Something deeper, beyond our conscious control, dictates our will. Baruch Spinoza, a 17th century philosopher, took this idea even further. He argued that free will is an illusion, and humans are nothing more than a collection of causes and effects. To Spinoza, believing in free will is like a rock rolling down a hill and thinking, I chose to roll this way, but in reality, the rock is just obeying the laws of physics, moved by forces outside of itself. David Hume, another major philosopher, agreed. He said that every action we take is caused by something else, whether it's our biology, past experiences, or external influences. If every choice has a cause, then how can we say we are truly free? Take a simple example. You're hungry, you see a burger, and eat it. Did you really choose to eat? or was your body just responding to hunger? Hume believed that what we call free will is just a chain reaction of causes and effects, stretching back to forces beyond our control. Then comes Friedrich Nietzsche, one of the most radical thinkers in philosophy. Nietzsche took things a step further. He believed that free will is a lie society tells us, a way to control behavior. Think about it. If people believe in free will, they believe in responsibility. That means they can be punished, blamed, or shamed for their actions. But if there is no free will, if people are just acting according to their nature and environment, then how can we blame them? To Nietzsche, the idea of free will was just a convenient myth, one that allowed religions, governments, and moral systems to justify reward and punishment. He saw humans as driven by deeper forces, such as the will to power, our fundamental drive to dominate, create, and expand. We don't make choices out of pure freedom. We act based on our instincts, emotions, and subconscious drives. So, who was right? Schopenhauer, Spinoza, Hume, and Nietzsche all suggested that free will is either limited or entirely an illusion. But if they were right, then what does that mean for us? Are we just biological machines reacting to forces we can't control? To answer this, we need to step out of philosophy and into science, where modern neuroscience and psychology might hold the final proof that we are not as free as we think. 
So far, philosophy has given us plenty of reasons to doubt free will, but what does science say? Can modern psychology and neuroscience prove that our choices aren't really ours? Let's start with one of the most famous and disturbing experiments in neuroscience, Benjamin Leibitz experiment. In the 1980s, neuroscientist Benjamin Libet conducted a simple but groundbreaking experiment. He asked participants to flex their wrist whenever they felt like it while looking at a special clock that recorded the exact moment they made the decision. Libet also measured their brain activity with electrodes. The results? Something shocking. Participants consciously decided to move their wrist at a certain moment, but before they chose, their brain had already started preparing for the movement several hundred milliseconds earlier. In other words, the brain made the decision before the person was even aware of it. This suggested that our conscious choices might just be a post-rationalization, a story we tell ourselves to explain actions that were already decided subconsciously, but it gets worse. Since Liebet's experiment, more advanced studies have confirmed that our brains predict our decisions seconds before we are aware of them. In 2008, researchers using fMRI scans found that scientists could predict a person's decision 7 to 10 seconds before they consciously made it. Think about that. Before you even think, I'll choose option A, your brain already knows what you're going to do. This challenges the very idea of you as a decision maker. If your brain decides before your conscious self is aware, then who or what is really in control. Even outside neuroscience, psychology shows us that our decisions are shaped by hidden forces without us realizing it. Take cognitive biases, mental shortcuts that influence how we think. Some of the most powerful ones include, first, the illusion of choice. You think you're choosing freely, but your options are already shaped by past experiences, societal conditioning, and even marketing tricks. Second, confirmation bias. You believe you're being rational, but your brain is just looking for evidence that supports what you already believe. And finally, the anchoring effect. Your decisions are influenced by the first piece of information you see, even if it's irrelevant. Let's try a quick example. Imagine you go shopping for a jacket. The first one you see costs $500. Then you see another for $150. That second jacket now seems cheap, even though it's still expensive. Did you choose to see it that way? Or did your brain just follow a hidden rule without you even knowing? Now let's shift our perspective. Let's consider the subconscious. Psychologists like Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung believe Believe that the subconscious mind holds far more power over us than we realize. Freud talked about the ID, our deep primitive urges that shape our actions without our awareness. Jung believed in the collective unconscious, a set of ingrained inherited instincts that influence our behaviors without us even knowing. Modern psychology has shown that most of our daily actions aren't even conscious. Studies show that 40 to 95 percent of what we do is automatic. Habits, responses, and routines we follow without thinking. The simple act of walking, talking, or even choosing what to eat is mostly driven by unconscious mental processes. So when you decide to eat that chocolate cake, was it really your free will? Or was it a mix of hunger, past experiences, advertisements you saw, and even your gut bacteria influencing your brain? So the verdict is, are we just observers? If neuroscience shows that our brain decides before we do, and psychology shows that our actions are shaped by subconscious forces, then are we really making decisions at all? Or are we just watching them happen like an audience in our own mind? Before we answer that, we need to ask, if free will is an illusion, what does that mean for morality, justice, and how we live? Let's explore that. So far, we've explored how philosophy, neuroscience, and psychology suggest that free will may be nothing more than an illusion. But this leads us to a much bigger and more unsettling question. If we don't have free will, what does that mean for morality, justice, and the way we live our lives? Because if we aren't truly in control, then can we be held responsible for our actions? Is punishment and reward even fair? Does anything we do really matter? Let's break it down. Imagine this. A man commits a terrible crime. Under normal circumstances, society punishes him because we believe he chose to do something wrong. But what if he didn't really choose? What if his actions were the result of genetics, childhood trauma, subconscious influences, or even neurological abnormalities? 
This isn't just hypothetical. Many legal cases have already used neuroscientific evidence to argue that criminals weren't truly responsible for their actions. Take the case of Charles Whitman, the Texas Tower sniper. In 1966, he killed 16 people in a mass shooting. Later, doctors found that he had a tumor pressing on his amygdala, the part of the brain that controls emotions and aggression. So, was he guilty? Or was he simply a machine acting under the influence of brain chemistry? This is the problem with free will. If people don't truly control their actions, then the entire justice system starts to look questionable. Does this mean no one is responsible? Not necessarily. Some thinkers believe that even if free will doesn't exist, responsibility still matters because society needs rules to function. For example, a car without brakes isn't choosing to crash, but you still remove it from the road to prevent harm. Similarly, even if criminals don't have free will, they may still need to be held accountable for the sake of social stability. But this raises another problem. If free will is an illusion, does anything matter? If every action is just a chain reaction of causes and effects, then is there any meaning to life at all? If you fall in love, was that destined to happen? Work hard for success? Was that just programmed into you? Try to change yourself. Was that already decided before you even tried? It's a terrifying thought, the idea that we are just watching our lives unfold instead of actually living them. Some people even experience an existential crisis when they first encounter this idea. If we don't have control, then what's the point of anything? But maybe we're looking at it the wrong way. Here's the strangest part. Even if free will doesn't exist, believing in it still matters. Studies show that when people are told they have no free will, they become less motivated, more likely to cheat and lie, less willing to help others. In other words, when people stop believing in free will, they often stop caring about morality and self-improvement. This creates a paradox. Free will may be an illusion, but believing in it helps society function. Determinism may be true, but embracing it completely could lead to chaos and meaninglessness. So where does that leave us? Are we just puppets of fate, or is there still something we can do? This leads us to our next question. Can we escape the illusion? So we've seen that philosophy, neuroscience, and psychology all point to the same unsettling truth. Free will might not exist. Our choices may just be the result of subconscious processes and external influences. We might just be observers of our own lives rather than the true authors. But here's the question. If free will is an illusion, is there any way to reclaim control? Are we doomed to just go through the motions? Or can we find a way to resist the forces that shape us? The answer might lie in something unexpected, awareness. Ironically, the first step to gaining control might be realizing how little control we actually have. Psychologists call this metacognition, the ability to think about our own thinking. Once you understand that your decisions are influenced by biases, subconscious forces, and environmental conditioning, you can start to catch yourself in the act. Here are some ways to do that. Spot your biases. When you make a decision, ask yourself, is this truly my choice? Or am I just following a mental shortcut? Question your habits. Many of your daily actions are automatic. Try switching them up and notice how much resistance your brain gives you. Also, you must analyze your emotions. Sometimes you don't choose how you feel. Your brain reacts before you're even aware of it. Instead of assuming your emotions are you, try observing them from a distance. By simply noticing these forces at play, you're already regaining a small amount of control. One of the most effective ways to weaken the illusion of free will is mindfulness meditation. Why? Because it trains you to watch your thoughts without immediately acting on them. In meditation, you sit still and observe your mind. Thoughts arise, but instead of following them, you simply notice them and let them pass. Over time, you start to realize that thoughts and impulses happen on their own. You don't actually choose them. This can be a powerful realization. If thoughts come and go automatically, then maybe your decisions do too. But here's the trick. By not reacting immediately, you give yourself a brief window of actual control. For example, you feel anger rising when someone insults you. Instead of reacting instantly, you notice the emotion, pause, and choose a response. In that moment of awareness, you break free from automatic behavior. Some researchers believe that even if we don't have traditional free will, we can still hack our own brains to make better decisions. 
for example, changing your environment. Since much of our behavior is shaped by external factors, simply altering our surroundings can influence our choices in a positive way. Want to eat healthier? Keep junk food out of the house? Want to be more productive? Remove distractions? Want to break a bad habit? Make it harder to access? You can also train new habits. If much of our behavior is automatic, then the best way to regain control might be to program better habits into our system. The brain follows patterns, so repeating positive actions can turn them into automatic behaviors, effectively hacking your subconscious. When it comes to impulses, you can delay them. Studies show that waiting just a few seconds before making a decision can weaken the power of automatic responses. Instead of acting immediately, give yourself time to reflect. This small delay can increase self-control and decision-making power. At the end of the day, even if free will is an illusion, acting as if it's real still helps us live better lives. Maybe we don't have full control, but maybe we don't need full control. Maybe the key isn't to completely break free from the illusion, but to navigate it wisely, to understand our biases, control our impulses, and shape our environments to lead better lives. Which leads us to the final question, what does this mean for you? If free will is just an illusion, if our choices are made before we're even aware of them, if our thoughts, behaviors, and even our sense of self are shaped by forces beyond our control, then how should we live our lives? Some people believe that even if free will isn't real, acting as if it is still makes life meaningful. We still experience choice, even if it's predetermined. We still feel like we're in control, and that feeling matters. Believing in free will helps us stay motivated, moral, and engaged in life. So maybe we don't need to break the illusion. Maybe the illusion itself is what keeps us moving forward. On the other hand, some argue that truly understanding the illusion of free will can be freeing, not depressing. If you aren't fully responsible for your desires, then maybe you don't need to feel guilty about them. If others are also acting based on subconscious forces, maybe we can be less judgmental and more compassionate. If life is just a chain of cause and effect, maybe we can let go of unnecessary stress and anxiety. After all, everything is unfolding exactly as it was always going to. This perspective can lead to a more detached, peaceful way of living where we observe life rather than constantly trying to control it. Of course, this all leads to one final paradox. If you decide that free will is real, was that decision freely made? If you reject the illusion of free will, was that rejection predetermined? Maybe you never had a choice in watching this video. Maybe your brain was already leading you here long before you even clicked play. Or maybe, just maybe, the choice was yours all along. We may never know for sure if free will exists, but whether it's real or not, what truly matters is how we choose to live with this knowledge. So the real question is, what do you believe? Let me know in the comments.